Welcome back for chapter 29, our second last chapter of this book. It's called Another Moon, Another Midnight. Another full moon shined on the dwarf forest, and at midnight the witches of the fairy tale world assembled at Dead Man's Creek on the wreckage of their formal headquarters. Gargoylea led the gathering from the tallest pile of debris. The gods have smiled upon us, sisters, Gargoyla preached. When we last met, we feared a witch hunt was in our future, but the fear can now be put to rest. Recently, great forces have descended through the kingdom, stripping powers from the hands of man and the fairies. Those who would have hunted us are now being hunted themselves. Rat Mary was among the small group who hadn't heard the news. What kind of forces do you speak of? The witches throughout the crowd were eager to share what they witnessed. I saw a fleet of soldiers attack the Eastern Kingdom, Serpentina hissed. They were tall and square, bore numbers and symbols on their armor. The Corner Kingdom was pillaged by a flock of, flock of winged monkeys, Tarantuline said. An army of men and women in yellow armor chain, uh, charged into the Charming Kingdom, Charcoline announced. Crows, wolves, and bees have taken over the Elf Empire, Arboreus said. And I've heard rumors of a flying ship that is holding the Northern Kingdom hostage. Don't you see, sisters, this is the dawning of a new era, Gargoylea said. We have nothing to fear anymore. The age of man and fairy is over. The witches cheered, cackled, growled, and hissed in celebration, but their rejoicing was cut short. If you believe that, then you are fools, a voice said from the forest. The witches looked around the woods, but didn't see who it came from. Look, the water is changing, Rat Mary said and pointed to the creek. The creek's current started flowing in the opposite direction and Moriana drifted in on a boat magically steering itself. Once the boat was docked, Moriana stepped out and joined the gathering. None of the witches had seen her in a long while and they were instantly intimidated by her presence. The witches parted out of her way as she climbed up the pile of wreckage where Gargoylea was standing. A large bag containing a small body levitated out of the boat and floated behind her as she went. The witches couldn't tell if the body was unconscious or dead. Why are you here, Moriana? Gar Gar Gargoylea said with a scathing look. You haven't been to a gathering in years. I've never been impressed with the leadership, Moriana said. Speaking of which, I think it's time for a change and I believe I'm the witch for the job. Gargoylea was outraged. The other witches could tell things were about to get ugly. How dare you, Gargoyle yelled. I faithfully led this congregation for years. I will not be asked to step aside, especially by the likes of you. No one asked you anything, Moriana said. She raised a hand toward Gargoyle, and the witch suddenly went as stiff as a board. Her stone skin cracked and chipped away until Gargoyle crumbled into nothing but a pile of rocks on the ground. The witches screamed and gasped in horror. It was the quickest way for Moriana to gain the gathering's attention and respect. The enemy of our enemy is not always our friend, Moriana told the witches. These forces have entered our world, are led by the masked man, the same man you all rejected during your last gathering. Now he has recruited an unstoppable army without your help, and he will not forget the way you discarded him. He is ruthless and cannot hold a grudge for decades. Once he has wiped the kingdoms clean of the royal families and the fairies, it will be our extermination he calls for next. And none of us will survive it. The witches looked around nervously at one another. The only thing they were more afraid of than Moriana was what she predicted. Then what can we do? Go into hiding? Charcoline asked. Moriana shook her head. The answer is not to cower, but to relocate. I am tired of being a secondary race, forced to live in shadow from shadow to shadow, all while others who outnumber us dictate and limit our way of life. It's time to move to a place where we can be the supreme species. It's time for our kind to travel to the other world. The other world, Ma Rat Mary asked. But that's just a legend. No, sisters, Moriana said. The other world is very real. I have just returned from it and saw it with my own eyes. There are plenty of places for us to prosper, billions of people to rule over, and no one to stop us. The idea of such a world intrigued the witches, but they had their doubts. How do we get to the other world, Serpentina asked. There are portals hidden all over the world left by the late fairy godmother, Moriana said. I found one in the woods of the Eastern Kingdom that the Grand Army entered from. But given the white magic the fairy godmother used to create it, the portal weakened and exhausted me. I doubt many of you would survive it. But do not fear, for an easier route is coming. I foresaw in my crystal ball that the worlds are about to collide. 
and when they do, the grand doorway will form that will offer us easy access to the other world. But what about the masked man, Arboris asked? Wouldn't he follow us and conquer the other world for himself? Luckily, I have planned for that, the Moriana said. The floating body fell to the ground, and she removed the bag from it in one swift pull. It was a sleeping little boy with dark hair, pale skin, and rosy cheeks. Emmerich Himmelsbach. Behold the masked man's son, Moriana boasted. Years ago, this child was hidden from his father because he never knew, he, before he even knew about the boy's existence. If the masked man or his army should ever pose a threat to us, the child will be a perfect leverage to keep him at bay. Our salvation is upon us. Before the witches had a chance to question her further, the air was filled with a sudden chill coming from the north and a salty breeze coming from the south. It caught them off guard, and they searched the trees for a sign of what was causing it. The witches watched in amazement as a strong frost traveled down the creek from the north and froze the water as it blew in. From the south, a strong tidal wave of murky ocean water flowed up the creek and flooded the bank. The frost and the wave met directly where the tavern used to stand. From the north, two enormous polar bears pulled this ice sleigh down the frozen creek. They transported a tall woman with pale frost-bitten skin. She wore a large, fluffy white coat, a snowflake crown, and a cloth wrapped around her eyes. From the south, four fins skimmed the creek surface as a school of sharks swam through the water. An elaborate sled made from several types of coral surfaced behind the sharks. The creature aboard had scaly turquoise skin and seaweed hair. It had six legs and large claws, like the bottom half of a creature was a crustacean. The legendary Snow Queen and the infamous Snow Sea Witch had arrived in style, and the witches were shocked to see them in person. They stepped out of the creek and walked up to the wreckage where Moriana stood. The Snow Queen was blind and used a long icicle to guide her, not caring whom she unintentionally struck with it. The Sea Witch stroked a cuttlefish resting on her shoulder and glared at the other woman around in the creek. Moriana may have intimidated the other witches, but they were terrified to be in the presence of the Snow Queen and the Sea Witch. They bowed as they passed. Even Moriana gave a shallow nod. Your Excellency, what brings you into the woods tonight? Moriana asked with a quiver in her voice. You are not the first witch to see the other world as a potential home, Moriana, the, sea wi the Snow Witch growled with her raspy voice. It has been a passion project of the Sea Witch and me for hundreds of years, but despite the approaching doorway, crossing over will not be as easy as you think. You underestimate the other world, the Sea Witch hissed. It's a world without magic, but a world that possesses technology far beyond your comprehension. They will use it against us the moment we try claiming the home as ours. Moriana did not appreciate being publicly discredited. How come you, uh, have you come out of seclusion just to prove me wrong? Or is there a way we can overcome the other world's defenses, she said in a spiteful tone that made the other witches nervous. Snide smiles grew across the Snow Queen and the Sea Witch's faces. We must create a weapon, the Snow Queen said. Something the other world won't stand a chance against, the Sea Witch hissed. What kind of weapon, Moriana asked. Not what, but who, the Snow Queen said. Years ago, the Sea Witch and I almost succeeded in creating it. We cursed a very powerful fairy known as Esmia, the late fairy godmother's former apprentice. The curse disturbed her emotions and caused her pain to intensify a thousand times stronger than anything else she felt. Tortured by heartbreak and overwhelmed with despair, she eventually became the Enchantress and wreaked havoc on the kingdoms. We put the idea of conquering both worlds into her head and she spent the majority of her life attempting it, the Sea Witch hissed. However, she was defeated by a fairy known as Alex Bailey, the late fairy godmother's granddaughter. Interestingly, Alex is a child of both worlds and therefore has the potential to be far more powerful than the Enchantress ever was. So the Snow Queen and I have set our sights on her. We put the same curse we cast on as Mia on Alex, the Snow Queen said. We watched it take hold of her just as it did as Mia. As the young fairy searched the kingdoms for the masked man, she was consumed by anger and lost control of her powers. We learned where we were right. She was much more powerful than as Mia, perhaps more powerful than any fairy who has ever lived. But with that power comes great strength, and the curse eventually faded. If she is too powerful for the curse, then how are we supposed to use her to vanquish the other world? Mother, uh, Moriana asked. The Snow Queen and the Sea Witch turned away from Moriana and faced all the witches in the gathering. The more witches who participate, the more powerful the curse becomes, the Sea Witch said. 
By combining our magic, we will cast a curse on Alex Bailey so powerful she'll never recover from it. Together we can transform the young fairy into the ultimate weapon, the Snow Queen said. She'll destroy the defenses of her former home, and the other world shall be ours. That's the end of chapter 29. The last chapter is called Chapter 30, The World at Stake. I'll be with you guys on that video so we can finish up this book. Have a nice day.